The comprehensive history of making things via molding is almost as long as the history of the people who were making them. For now, I'll zoom in on some key technological advances relevant to this course in particular. Some of the oldest evidence of mold making and casting is found from the Mesopotamian civilization, wherein bronze bowls were made using sand casting. As the technology developed, artisans would hand carve wax into the master shape and cast it. These ancient examples were often small pieces of jewelry or religious artifacts. Other methods of mold making and casting made use of biological resins like animal horns and tree gums to make master forms from. Due to limitations in materials and available technology, these were usually small scale goods made by master craftsmen, custom to order. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the craftsmanship era was defined by cottage industry, i.e. artisanal goods made at home. Made objects, especially the ones using mold making techniques, were made to order unique and difficult to produce. A considerable amount of skilled labor and craftsmanship was required for the construction of everyday objects. This took a long time, comparatively, which was reflected in items with built-in longevity and relatively high per unit cost. Even the best made goods were inconsistent in shape and usually unique. Each part or component of a finished product had to be carefully hand-shaped or formed to fit together, even the first automobiles. Crafts made via the cottage industry also had a complex distribution system, as the purchaser of the goods had to go house to house to deliver raw materials and then come back to collect the goods for market sale. The Industrial Revolution created a massive shift from industrial craftsmen or guilds doing every aspect of comprehensive building to machines doing as much as could be automated with specialized workers doing repetitive tasks in centralized locations, factories. Development of machine tools were important in the factory boom as factories increasingly made use of machines and unskilled repetitive labor, and machine tools aided in making consistently more accurate parts. As metallurgy and refineries developed cheap but reliable iron and steel, machines started being constructed from metal parts, which unlike wood-framed machines were not prone to changing shape with humidity and temperature. The invention of interchangeable parts by Eli Whitney was massively important. No longer would individual parts of, say, a motor, have to be machined and shaped to fit other parts. Near-identical parts could be replaced, which meant a less skilled workforce could assemble parts much more quickly. As all parts wear, this is extremely advantageous because this increases the lifetime of a machine in use. The idea of spare parts spread from military usage to other industries, especially transportation, and set the stage for the age of the automobile. As machine technology and material technology continued to advance, Ransom Eli Olds, the founder of Oldsmobile, invented the assembly line. Oldsmobile cars were still pretty custom and expensive at the time, a rich man's curiosity, so it was still uncommon for people to own their own vehicles. That is, until Henry Ford streamlined factory technology by implementing a moving assembly line. This implementation was inspired by a meatpacking plant and had a massive impact on the entire industrialized world. His emphasis on what is now known as lean manufacturing made his famous car, the Model T, reliable and affordable for the common person, whereas previous to Fordism, cars were novelty items only affordable to the extremely wealthy and prone to all sorts of maintenance issues. Ford also had a massive impact on working standards for the Western world, the standard work week, of 40 hours is based in part on Ford's emphasis on investing in his workers, forcing competitors to improve wages and working conditions to keep up. Around the same time, celluloid was developed as the first reliable plastic to replace the ivory in billiard balls. While it could be shaped and formed easily, a major downside is that celluloid is extremely flammable, making it unusable in applications where it might come into contact with heat. Less flammable plastics were developed for use in film reels and were labeled safety films. A semi-synthetic plastic, casein, was developed using milk proteins for use in buttons, buckles, and fountain pens. Casein has a lustrous pearlescent sheen, but deforms under the curing process. So products made from casein were generally machined after curing and suffered from some splintering effects. The first truly synthetic successful plastic, Bakelite, was developed using formaldehyde by Leo Bakeland. Bakelite was originally designed for use in composites with natural fibers, but was later used on its own for use in heat-resistant applications like phone and radio casings. 
Chemists and inventors continue producing more diverse and specialized plastics, emphasizing or de-emphasizing certain characteristics for use in ever-evolving applications. The interdependent development of machine technology and material technology continues to grow in leaps and bounds, the primary focus being the fastest, cheapest way to produce things. This emphasis on cost efficiency sometimes fails to take into account the product's end of life. Many materials take thousands of years to biodegrade, which isn't necessary, even for extremely long product lifetimes. In addition, most sources of synthetic plastics rely on unsustainable fossil fuels, which we will run out of. Some companies are making a point of including sustainable principles in material acquisition, production, and closed loop cycles, while new materials and methods are developing all the time. My hope is that we can develop plastics and other composite materials that perform extremely well during the product lifetime, but afterwards can be easily broken back down into the production stream, reducing waste. Lastly, the industry knowledge developed from naturally occurring formable materials and metal casting had a major impact on the development of plastics manufacturing. For example, fluid flow, shrinkage, and temperature control all have metal to plastic correlation. Other design specifications, like material thickness, post-processing, and most importantly, bivalve, or two-part molding production of plastics, would not have been made possible without developments in metal technology. In short, current manufacturing technology combines our composite human knowledge of chemistry, machinery, interchangeable parts, assembly lines, and user needs. Some traditional methods of mold making and casting are still used today and can be combined with the advantage of modern materials and methods. Take a minute and think about what's better in your life due to some fantastic plastic.